places. Um, if you have children, they're very family friendly as well. Um, so, so check those out. Just a great way to get to know our church a little bit. Great way to connect um, and meet some folks uh, in the church as well. Um, and then also want to let you know, um, today is the last day for the Ukraine um, giving. Um, so you probably saw some buckets out in the gathering. Um, you can give your bills or your change. Um, but also you can give online on our website. There's a tab on our giving uh, website for Ukraine. And we're going to um, let this be the last, last week for that. So, um, so if you'd like to give to Ukraine, please uh, do that. Um, and, uh, and with that, um, I want to invite Scott up uh, to continue uh, in a corporate reading as we continue to worship. All right, please uh, stand and join me in this. Last week, we, uh, we read from John 20, verses uh, 21 and 22, as we talked about Jesus' gift of the Spirit, the Spirit of resurrection, of peace, and mission. So we read from uh, John 20, verses 21 and 22. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And this morning, I invite you guys to join me in praying um, a very old prayer, an adaption of a very old prayer called Come Holy Spirit. I'll read the leader parts and invite you guys to join me for the response. Holy Spirit, in the beginning you hovered over the waters. From your breath, all creation drew life, and without you, life turns to dust. Come, Holy Spirit. By your inspiration, the prophets um, spoke. By your authority, they acted in faith. And by your power, they bore your word to all who would listen. Come, Holy Spirit. You empowered Jesus for his ministry and death. You raised him from the grave, and you came as fire to his disciples, giving them voice before the rulers of the world. Come, Holy Spirit. You adopted us as children of God. You make us the living temple of your presence, and you intercede within us with sighs too deep for words. Come, Holy Spirit. You bind up the brokenhearted. You heal the sick and make the lame walk, and you open the eyes of the blind. Come, Holy Spirit. You fell upon your church at Pentecost. You send us out to declare the good news of Jesus Christ risen, and you empower us to make tangible the kingdom of God on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, from whom comes every good gift, pour out your spirit in our lives with the power of a mighty wind. Open the horizons of our heart and our minds by the flame of your wisdom. Loosen our tongues to shout your praise and fill us with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. Let us continue to worship the Lord this morning.
Uh, before we take our uh, tithes and offerings, I want to first dismiss the kids. So kids four and up to fifth grade, if you are participating in the kids' ministry, you can start heading towards those doors. My right, your left. And if you're too young to know what right and left is, follow the herd. You'll be all right. You'll be all right.
Right. I love the amount of toys that the kids are holding. Awesome. Um, well, we are going to uh, take, part of our worship is uh, taking of tithes and offerings. And, uh, and one of the ways that we, we've been passing the basket again um, post-COVID. Um, really, I know a lot of people give online as a church family, but just kind of as a symbolic way, just to remember that God's been gracious and generous to us, and that's why we give. Um, not out of, I have to, or uh, God's going to punish me, but because he's been generous in a million different ways to us as Jesus has come and given his life for us and loved us and forgiven us that we respond out of gratitude and generosity. Um, and so just a moment, the um, ushers will uh, pass the plates. There's also giving boxes in the front and the back, and then also um, you can give online as well if that is easier uh, for you this morning. So with that, before we take our offering, I'd like to open in a word of prayer. Father, uh, thank you uh, for your goodness to us. We, we've sang that a lot this morning. We, we've sang about your mercy toward us. And, and it's a pretty astounding thing if we really pause for a moment to think how far and deep and wide your mercy goes. That, that we can't as small, little, finite humans begin to comprehend how deep and wide your mercy is. But one of the best ways that we can do that and is to look at the, the face of your son and, and to see him living and dying and rising again to show this is how merciful I am. This is how loving I am, that I would give my only son for your sins, that I would forgive you, that I would extend mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace to us. That you'd even, in your gracious mercy, show us what you're like, that there's a lot of things we don't know about you, God, but there's so much we do because you've given us your son, Jesus, to say, this is what I am. This is who I am. This is how I, I move in the world. This is how I act. This is my character. This is my, my nature. And as we look at that, God, as we reflect on that, even as we've walked through that in the Gospel of John these many weeks and months together as a church family, we, we get a glimmer of a, of a God who is full of grace and full of truth, a God who loves his enemies, a God who forgives those who the world would say aren't worth forgiving. A God who heals, a God who teaches, a God who points us to good news. And, and, and that's who you are, God. And, and so for that, we're thankful. And God, I ask this morning that we could be those kinds of people, the kind of people that, that learn how to forgive each other. They, they, they learn how to forgive their neighbors. They learn how to forgive even their enemies. People that offer hope. People that offer love to those who don't seem worthy. So God, help us be a church like that. Help us be salt and light wherever we are found in our work and in our homes and in our neighborhoods, oh God. Because we have much to be thankful for, for who you are and the mercy that you've shown us and the goodness that you've, you've shown us, oh God. And God, we know we come this morning as a church family with there's different sicknesses, there's different struggles, there's, there's fears, there's doubts, there's job challenges, there's family challenges, God. And we just ask that, um, that you would meet us in those places wherever the anxiety, the worry, the fear has crept in, God, would you meet us there with your grace and with your peace? And God, now as we open your word, would you speak to us by your Holy Spirit? Would you illuminate our hearts and minds to hear and receive what you have to say to us, oh God? And God, it would also be important for us to not, to not remember just what's going on in this space, but also to remember those that are hurting in Ukraine and around the world, those that are... Um, refugees, those that are, are in pain, those that are struggling with conflict and war, God, and just have no place to go, God, would your grace and your peace meet them? And God, help us to be peacemakers in our little corner of the universe. And so, God, we give these tithes and we give these offerings now as a response to your generosity and your grace and your mercy towards us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, we'll take our tithes and offerings. Amen. Good morning, New City. Uh, it is good to be with you this morning to bring forth God's Word as we uh, close out the Gospel of John together. 
Uh, fortunately for me, I teach at a Christian school locally, and uh, before I even came on as one of the pastors here at this church, I decided that we would go through the Gospel of John with some of my classes. And so, man, I've been double dipping like every week. I get it here, I get it at school, and then I've also just been reading it in my own time with the Lord, and man, it's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's been a blessing to you as well. Uh, so we're going to open up in uh, John chapter 21, the last chapter of this gospel. Um, and so this morning, um, we are going to catch a glimpse of Jesus that leads to mission. We're going to catch a glimpse of Jesus. We're going to try and look at Jesus through this passage in John 21, but also what we have seen from Jesus throughout the whole book of John in some ways. I mean, not all the way. We'd be here for hours, right? Like, Everybody wants got to beat the Methodists to Cracker Barrel. Um, so I'm not going to preach through the whole, but we're going to try and get a, a glimpse of Jesus from the gospel uh, of what he is like. Uh, because the Jen Wilkin, who I don't know if you know who that is, but she's a, a wonderful writer. My wife showed me her a couple years ago. But she said, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. So if later in John 21, we're going to get to this famous passage where Jesus has this conversation with Peter, where he's like, hey, Peter, do you love me? Well, how are we supposed to love something that we don't know? So we need to catch a glimpse of Jesus from this gospel and from this, this chapter. So let's catch a glimpse of Jesus together. Amen? And we'll dive in this together to try it. Who is Jesus? And I think, man, the glory of the gospels is that it, they close with a question of us. They present Jesus to us, and then they say to us, is Jesus truly God? And if he is God, is he truly worthy of our worship? And that's what we're going to try and answer today. So I don't know if you, uh, as a child, were dragged to local ponds and lakes to do one of the most boring activities in the history of the world. Fishing. Uh, my dad and my brother loved to fish, and they would drag me to local places to fish with them. I am not a patient man by nature. I'm a mover arounder kind of guy. And so fishing, it, it was not for me, but there was one day a year that I loved to fish. It's March 1st. And March 1st was opening trout day at Roaring River State Park. You guys know where Roaring River is? It's a beautiful place. But they release all of the trout at one time in this one stream, and then they, they funnel out into all over the state. And on that day, on opening day, it was like very American. Like somebody would shoot a shotgun and like they would release the fish. And then you could literally just stand next to the stream and toss your line in while thousands of fish are streaming through. And you're just like reeling them in. Like, oh, I'm amazing at this. I'm the best fisherman ever. Right? And so it, it was a great day of fishing. Uh, but that's not what we find the disciples in this current situation, right? Look at it. John 21, verses 4 through 8 with me. So a little bit of context. The disciples uh, have seen the risen Lord, right? They've seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. And now they decide to go fishing. And there's seven of them all together. And they went out in the boat. And it says, uh, verse 4, Just as day was breaking, uh, Jesus stood on the shore. Uh, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Uh, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, about a about hundred yards off. So we have, uh, the disciples have a rough night of fishing, right? And they get back to the boat, uh, and they haven't had any luck. And so there's a guy on the shore, which you can imagine this in your mind. It's a strange picture. Some random dude is sitting on the beach. They don't know it's Jesus yet. And he's like, hey, throw your nets on the other side. And they're like, sure, why not? <laughs> and so they do, and they catch a ton of fish. And this is not the first time that this has happened, right? Uh, look back over at Luke uh, chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, if you have your Bible with you. Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 9. And it says, And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled with the boats and the, be, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Uh, just as a side note here, I was struck by this when I was writing this, this sermon this past week. Do you guys see uh, the differences uh, between these two miracles of the catching of the fish and the life of Peter? So in Luke, in chapter 5, what's his response to Jesus after this miracle? It says in verse, verse 8 of chapter 5 of Luke, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And then we turn over to John chapter 21, which is after, after Peter has experienced the risen Lord. And what's his response to the miracle of Jesus? He runs to Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful example of what happens in our life? As we deeply, like John 15 kind of language here, as we abide in Jesus, as we linger with God, as we spend time with God, the more that we come to know of his nature so that no longer do we say, Lord, depart from me, but instead we run to Jesus. I think that's a beautiful uh, act of redemption in the life of Peter that we're going to see in John 21, and we're going to see it again later as well. But also, it, it's, I find it strangely ironic. Uh, in chapter 20, we talked about last week um, that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? It says in John uh, 20, uh, 22 and 23, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And then we get to chapter 21, and these disciples are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, but what can't they do? Catch any fish. <laughs> I think it's just this wonderful moment of irony. Um, if you've seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, there's this great scene where George Bailey, he's in a bar, he's, he's on his last leg, man, and he prays this prayer of desperation to God, God, please, please help me. And then the next moment, does anybody remember what happens? He gets decked in the face by the guy sitting next to him because he had insulted his wife. And it seems like for the disciples, it's a similar moment here. Like, man, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We have all this power. We can forgive sins. We can do all this crazy stuff, but we can't catch any fish. And so Jesus, he, he calls out to them from the shore. They don't recognize him. And they, he says, hey, toss your net on the other side. And what happens when they toss their net? They, they bring in this huge quantity of fish. And so uh, we get to verse 12. So Simon Peter has jumped out of the boat, said he had to get clothed first. He jumps out of the boat and he, he swims into Jesus. And uh, Jesus said to them in verse 12, come and have breakfast. Oh man, beautiful words from the mouth of Jesus. Guys, we're talking about the risen Lord, right? So Jesus has died and he has now risen from the grave. And how does he want to spend his last days on earth? Having breakfast with a ragtag group of fishermen who are obviously not very good at fishing. Come and have breakfast. Uh, to, to quote the great theologian Victoria Rogers, uh, Jesus is having, is having breakfast on the beach with his besties. <laughs> Jesus is having breakfast on the beach, beach with his besties. And man, I think this is beautiful because I think that Jesus is establishing the holiness of the ordinary, right? That this, this breakfast, it really matters. Again, this is Jesus fully resurrected from the grave, right? He, he is full of power and this is how he's spending his last moments is with these people eating some fish. I think it's beautiful and I think it gives us a glimpse of who Jesus is but also gives us a glimpse of what we're called to. Uh, and doesn't this line up with what we've seen from Jesus? Think back over the gospel with me. Uh, John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine at a podunk wedding in Cana. John chapter 4, Jesus asks a Samaritan woman for a drink of water and offers her living springs of water. Uh, John 6, uh, loaves and fish to feed thousands of people. John 8, he writes in the dirt and saves this woman from being stoned when she's caught in adultery. John 9, spit in dirt to heal the man born blind. John 11, Jesus weeps with the mourners of Lazarus. John 12, Jesus enters into Jerusalem riding a donkey. 
John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. John 15, Jesus calls himself the vine. And John 21, Jesus has breakfast with his besties on the beach. <laughs> right? Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus, all throughout the gospel, is doing incredible things, right? He's making blind people see. He's raising the dead to life. But I can't help but notice and love Jesus for the ordinary means by which he did these incredible things. Jesus just doesn't do things like we would. He just doesn't. Like, can you just imagine, like, if you were the Messiah and, like, you rolled up into Jerusalem like, and you could just, like, cause a golden mountain to, to come up from the earth, right? That you could do whatever you wanted to show off, to show your power, to show your greatness. And what does Jesus use to show who he really is? Loaves and fish, spit and dirt, riding a donkey. Who is this God? <laughs> I, I, I want us this morning to really, we're trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus, right? Who is this God? And is he worthy of our worship? And man, this Jesus is quite compelling. And it's encouraging to my heart and hopefully to yours that he doesn't act like you would, right? He is separate from us. He does things much differently than we do. And I think this gives us an idea too about our, our mission in some sense that when you look at the church around us, we have become consumed with what is the most exciting? How do we create more programs to get people in? We got, you know, petting zoos on Easter Sunday and whatever else that we need to do. We got a uh, movie night at church. And I'm not standing in judgment of any of these churches. There's, there's gospel ministry going forth wherever we are. But there seems to be this, this movement towards how do we be the most exciting thing on the block? If we have to compete with Netflix and Hulu, how do we make this better? How do we get this more exciting? And then we see Jesus in the Gospels eating breakfast on one of, one of his last days on earth with his best friends on the beach, right? This the ordinary holiness that God is calling us into. So what if Jesus is calling us to a life of ordinary holiness? So, yeah, that makes sense for the, the church, Matt. I understand that. But what does that mean for me? Well, I think on a personal level, we can get from John 21 the importance of, and I feel like as one of your pastors, I hear this from the other pastors all the time, the glory and the beauty of Christian hospitality. Opening your home up to people, eating meals with people. Uh, Again, guys, we're looking, we're trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus, and what is he doing with his last day? He's eating a meal with his friends. Guys, these things matter. These small, seemingly insignificant things matter to God. When you invite someone into your life, when you share a meal with them, you are doing the Lord's work. <laughs> you are building the kingdom of God, and it matters deeply to God. <clears throat> so Christian hospitality is a huge part of, of working out this ordinary holiness. And I think as well, I think you have heard from Ryan before the, the glory of guacamole and fajitas, uh, but learning to see and savor Jesus Christ in very ordinary, mundane things. Uh, last summer, I built a deck off the back of my house well, when I say I built a deck, that's a lie. I didn't. I, I, was, I, was, I brought drinks to people who are much more talented than me. Uh, I'm not a natural builder by any sense of the world word, but man, God has blessed me with some people who are really talented in that way. And man, this deck, I need to have all of you over so you can sit on my deck. It is, it's, it's a glorious experience. And guys, what if, what if God is concerned about my worship of him through a good deck? And what if God is concerned with me worshiping him through the glory of my garden? We just planted our garden and our vegetables are starting to grow and this new life that sprouts up from the earth. What if these seemingly insignificant things inspired worship within us? The ordinary holiness of life. That these things, these are holy moments. Every night before bed, um, I, I go put Olivia, my daughter, to bed and she's four and we have this thing called Livy Kisses, where she kisses me all over my face. And I hope that you guys probably have a similar experience. Um, I put this in my sermon before she had a massive mental breakdown last night. 
so I'm regretting it a little bit, but <laughs> no, man, like, uh, guys, these moments, these, these kisses, guys, this is a short season of life you have with your kids, right? This is a short season that you have. Those moments of Livy kisses are worthy of my worship. They are worthy of worshiping and noticing God for his goodness to me, his providence to me in providing me with these children to love and to shepherd and to care for. Man, take your moments and your days. I think I, I, at the last equip night, I talked about this a little bit, but for all of my life, I associated my relationship with Jesus into three things, and it was the Bible, prayer, and church. Now, guys, are these three things vitally important for the life of a believer? We can't live without them. We will starve, right? We will die without God's word, without prayer, without being in fellowship with other believers. But man, is, are those the only three spaces that God inhabits? No. He is at your workplace. He's in the glory of a beautiful meal. He's in the good hug of a friend. Learn, practice seeing him and savoring him in the holy, ordinary moments of your life. Right? Because this is what Jesus did. He took seemingly insignificant moments and made them holy and beautiful. And you are welcomed into that as well. Learn to do that. Just turn your thoughts to him. When you experience something beautiful, when you see a really good tree, <laughs> it's worthy of worship. God, like, thank you for that tree. <laughs> it's worth that thought. And that might sound to some of you, oh, that's, that's, that's childish. That's, it's not. <laughs> it's all over the scriptures, man. Have you read the Psalms? David just is like repeatedly finding things that he really likes and thanking God for them. And we're welcomed into that as well. So this is who Jesus is, right? He uses these ordinary means to accomplish these incredible things, and we're welcomed into that. So if this is who Jesus is, if we've caught a glimpse of him, what should our response be to him? We should love Jesus. And that love leads to our mission. Uh, look at John 21, verses 15 through 17. 15 through 17, John 21. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Uh, scholar N.T. Wright said, the three questions correspond to Peter's three denials, right? Again, we have like this beautiful redemption of Peter. <laughs> Uh, the three questions correspond to Peter's three denials. Three for completeness, yes, but three also for reminder. The smell of the charcoal fire lingers. Peter's night of agony and Jesus' own night of agony returns, but because of the latter, the former can be dealt with. Right? So Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus asks him these three questions, and it's this beautiful redemption of Peter. In the same way that we saw the differences between Luke 5 and John 21, that Jesus is in the process of redeeming Peter, and isn't he in the process of redeeming us, right? So, and the same question comes to us today. Matt, do you love me? Fill in your name there, blank. Do you love me? And people of God, has God given us great reasons for us to love him? When you think upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, that who you were before you put your faith in Christ, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God did what? He made us alive together with him. By grace you have been saved. Listen to this word from Romans 5, uh, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
You have been given much reason to love God through Jesus Christ. We who deserve nothing have been given everything. And the only right response to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the pouring out of our love. Because what you love is at the center of who you are. That is who you are. What you love is who you are. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him? Does your life reflect that you love him? And there are all of these things all around us that are constantly competing for our love, right? There's a reason that Jesus spends so much time talking about money in the Gospels. Don't love money. Well, why? Because Jesus knows that we're tempted to love money. We, we take even good things like our families and our, and our jobs and we turn them into idols and we twist them and morph them and love them more than God. Do you love Jesus when you reflect on the gospel, when you think about who you were and where you've been, what you've been brought into, what is the response of your heart? It can't be an analytical, oh, I know the truth of the gospel. There has to be an emotional response to Jesus. Do you love him for what he has done for you? And we know this, many things have been done in the name of Jesus and maybe even with some good knowledge of Jesus, but devoid of love for Jesus. We are dealing, uh, in the church right now, we are in a, a strange stage. You've probably heard this phrase tossed around a, a little bit of, of deconstruction, right? Where we have people, and I have people, Victoria and I have people in our life who grew up in the church who are now like leaving the faith, who are going off into to other things. They're finding transcendence and spiritualism and all this deep stuff. And a lot of it, when you talk to these people, I mean, some of them are just really lame, right? They're just like, oh, I don't believe that anymore, so I left. But man, a lot of people have been deeply hurt by people who said they love Jesus and acted very unkindly to them. And I'm sure that all of us have stories in that too. And that's not the heart of Christ. And that's not the heart that we should have towards these people. Uh, how do we love them? Again, how do we welcome them into ordinary holiness? Maybe you know someone in your life uh, who is going through that process of not really knowing where they stand with things, welcome them into your life. Invite them over for dinner. <laughs> Share the good news of Jesus with them. Encourage them. Build them up in the faith. Uh, Dallas Willard said, uh, the acid test for any theology is this. Is the God presented one that can be loved, heart, soul, mind, and strength? strength? If the thoughtful answer is not really, then we need to look elsewhere or deeper. It does not really matter how sophisticated or doctrinally our approach is if it fails to set a lovable God, a radiant, happy, friendly, accessible, and totally competent being before ordinary people, we have gone wrong. We should not keep going in the same direction, but turn around and take another road. If the God that we have presented is not lovable, we have gone down the wrong road. So, how do we love Jesus in such a way that it leads to mission, right? So we, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. We, we're trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Who is this God? Who is he? What is our response as we look to him? Our response is deep love. We, we want to love Jesus for his goodness to us. And then how does that lead to mission? How do we feed the sheep like Jesus commands Peter to do? And I wrote this down. There is no way for us to faithfully follow the mission, the mission that Jesus gives us to go and make disciples if we are not deeply rooted in the love of God. There is no hope of mission unless we are deeply rooted in the love of God. And we see that in the text, right? What question does Jesus ask Peter before telling him to feed the sheep? Do you love me? Love is the motivator for all of our good works. It is the thing that, it's the engine that drives what we do. We respond to the gospel of Jesus with love for him because of his goodness to us and then that compels us to do things, to love our neighbor, to speak kindly to a kid who doesn't deserve it, 
right? Man, we respond to the gospel with love that inspires us to live out this ordinary holiness together. Do you long to see your children follow God? Love Jesus. Do you long to see your unbelieving family members come to believe the good news of the gospel? Love Jesus. Do you long to see this church used mightily by God to change our community and the world? Love Jesus. And as we love Jesus, we are on mission for Jesus because we can't help it, man. (laughs) When you experience the love of God, how can you keep that to yourself? When we are deeply rooted in the love of God, it comes forth from us in the way that we live. Oh, so as we come to the close of our time here together, uh, here's a couple points of application for us to actually do this together. How do we, how do we accomplish this uh, together? Uh, catching, number one, catching a glimpse of Jesus is not a one-time thing. Catching a glimpse of Jesus is not a one-time thing. Looking at Jesus is is a thing that we should be doing every day. You need to be in your Bible. (laughs) You need to read of Jesus. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, should be a regular part of your scriptural diet. Read of who Jesus was. I think all of us are in danger um, of building a idea of Jesus from what we've experienced or maybe in the, the, the places that you grew up. Uh, and then you read the scriptures and sometimes it just kind of smacks you around like, oh man, that's not who Jesus is at all. Is your idea of who Jesus is being formed by the Bible or is it being formed by everything else that you've experienced? Catching a glimpse of Jesus, guys, it's an everyday thing. Be in it. Ah, man, I... Read it. Look at it. Feast on it. Spend your life here. Waste your time here. Waste your whole life learning of Jesus. Because as we catch a glimpse of Jesus, what does that turn into? It turns into love for Jesus. Right? So it turns into love for Jesus. We love Jesus for who he is and what he said and, and how he acts towards people. I mean, don't you read these stories in the gospel, like John chapter 8, right? This, this woman who's caught in adultery. She's brought before these men, and they all line up to stone her. They're going to stone her to death. Do you know who's glaringly absent from this scene? The man? What is going on in this story? And Jesus very cryptically begins to write in the dirt. And they're, they're all lining up, and they're getting angry and ready to stone her. And He's writing in the dirt. <laughs> and he stands up, and he says, Hey, is there, is there no one left to condemn you? She says, No one, Lord. The only person in this whole scene who rightly recognizes Jesus for who he really is is the woman who's caught in adultery. And he says to her, and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We are not condemned anymore. And then what is the motivation for not sinning? Love, the love of God. We are filled with the love of God and it keeps us from sin. When we daily feast upon the goodness of Jesus, through prayer and through reading the scriptures and through gathering in city groups and gathering here on Sunday mornings, we are uh, working within ourselves to keep ourselves from sin. Because when you taste the goodness of God, sin becomes so bitter. It just becomes so bitter. And it brings nothing with it but guilt and shame. But what does Jesus promise to us? Life and peace. Feast upon him. Look at him. Catch a glimpse of him every day. Read of him. And then number two, be on mission for Jesus in the holy, ordinary moments of your life. Invite someone to breakfast. Invite someone to breakfast. Be like Jesus. Invite someone to breakfast. That's my new slogan. (laughs) Be like Jesus. Invite someone to breakfast. Uh, Guys, these these holy moments, these, these small, seemingly insignificant moments really matter Again, Jesus, the resurrected Lord, is spending his final days eating breakfast with his friends on the beach. This is a model for us as we go forth. Uh, You know, guys, like we, you can invite your neighbor over and over and over and over again to come to church. And a lot of the times, you know what they're probably going to say to you? No, but if you invite them over for dinner, yeah, it will, they will, this is it, guys, 
this is the culture that we live in, and we can pretend like it's 1950s America where everyone on the block goes to church, but it's just not the truth. Invite them into your home. Eat dinner with them. This is, guys, we have city groups not just because we want to cloister ourselves and sequester ourselves off from everybody else, but so that it's, it's an easy invite for you. Hey, listen, I get together with some friends from my church on Tuesdays at <laughs> Jerry's house. Bring your kids. They don't have enough people, so bring more. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a way for you to invite people into a, a place, guys, that a lot of people are much more comfortable going to. So invite people for breakfast. Invite people into your homes. Invite people into the center of your lives. And share the good news of Jesus with them in those moments. Right? That God longs to use those moments to impact the people around you. Uh, so do that. And then learn to enjoy Jesus and just the really ordinary things in your life. Good meals, good friends, good music, a good movie. All of these things are worthy of your worship. To Take some time and say, God, thank you for your goodness to me. Chiefly right in the gospel that we've been saved from death, that we deserve nothing. But then on this side of redemption, if you're a believer in Jesus, everything else matters too. Everything else matters so the way that we enjoy things, the way that we love our families, these things matter to God. And he's shown that to us over and over again through the Gospel of John. These ordinary things really matter. And then lastly, uh, look at the last verse of John 21, the last verse of this Gospel, verse 25. And it says, Now there, were, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And we are welcomed into what Jesus continues to do. Every act of kindness, every act of patience towards a small human, every act of love for Jesus is a part of the ongoing story of what Jesus is continuing to do in us. And there could never be enough books in the world to contain it. Jesus, upon his death and resurrection, did not leave us alone. But he filled us with his spirit. And now we are a part of this story of what Jesus is continuing to do in the world. That he is building his kingdom. And those small moments that you have in your life that you think are insignificant, God sees them and he's honored in them. The way that you work and the way that you love your families, all of these things matter so we're welcomed into this, and there could never be enough books in the world to contain all of the good things that Jesus is doing in us. Amen? He's working. And this morning, as we do every week, we have this opportunity to come to this table uh, to be a part of the continuation of that story where we celebrate uh, Jesus and what he's done for us in, in the breaking of his body and the spilling of his blood. And we, we come to the table uh, to remember to remember for ourselves, and we also remind one another of what Jesus has done for us, and we rejoice in it. Uh, I think one of the greatest, <laughs> the worst part, one of the worst parts of Christianity today is just an absurd lack of thankfulness. We just don't seem to be very thankful. Guys, when we reflect upon the gospel, let it fill your heart with thankfulness. And as we take from this table today, may your heart uh, be thankful. Um, so here at New City, uh, we, we come towards the table at the front. Um, there are gluten-free options in the middle, if that's what you need. Um, and there'll be people up here to, to help you as you come. Um, but let me, let me pray for us, and then would you come and take the table with me? Lord Jesus, God, there is no one like you. God, as we read from your word, we just find ourselves confronted with a God who acts nothing like we would. And God, there's great hope and comfort in that. Lord, this morning, God, would you be honored in your people. Lord, as, as we come to, to catch a glimpse of you, to look at you, God, so that we might love you better. God, that as we're filled with your love, that we might be sent out. God, to love the people around us, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love our children, to love our families. God, would you work a mighty work within us, God, to transform us more into the image of your Son. Lord, and we long for the day that you will return and make all things right. So come, Lord Jesus. 
And God, as we wait, God, may this table remind us, God, of one day that we will feast in the house of Zion, Lord, and there will be no weeping. And God, we will dwell in perfect unity with you forever. We love you, King Jesus, ruler of the world, ruler of all things, who made himself known to us, God. We are truly a thankful people this morning. Thank you for all of this, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you come and take
As we close today, hear these words from John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now you go and do likewise. Amen. Go in his peace today.
Ooh.